we are we are live, and I will do another tweet real quick, and then we'll get, uh, get the right. show on the road. Hey, live audience, how are you guys doing? Please uh, get your questions ready because we like questions. We love questions. Although, did the Q and A app disable itself? Hold on a second. Uh oh. It, you know, David, the the we've been using Google Hangouts, and it's great. It's really cool. But every week we do the show, <laughs> Something something's happens. different. No, it's like it's like they redesign it weekly. And so, like, it, it would be like walking out to your car and it's painted a different color. Like, it's still the same yeah. car, but it just looks different every week. Everything's well, always in a different place. You know, the thing is, they um, they actually uh, they watch your show every week and they make tweaks based on what they see. I talk That's to those right. guys. Yeah. That's funny. That's oh great. boy. All right. Well, I am ready to go when you both are. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Did you did you include my Twitter handle in your tweet? Oh, I need to let me what is your Twitter handle? Let me make sure I get everything in here correctly. Uh, otherwise, how can I retweet it? That's there right. That's right. What is your Twitter handle? I should have it, but I don't. Uh, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Um I I typed it into oh. the screen. Oh, there we go. Let me find it in there. Which one are you? Which screen are you on? There's that's the other problem with this thing. There's 1,200 screens that they. Uh, there it is. Oh, there I, I got just, it. I just see one screen. Oh, I got it. Yeah, there's um. Well, oh, look at that. Juan has a command center. So. Yeah. There we yeah. Go. Okay. So now we're good. Let me just pull this other thing back up here. <laughs> it's it's it is it is funny though. It's like every week we've got to like relearn where everything is. Uh, oh, you can do screen share. This is pretty. Oh cool. yeah, this is really this is slick stuff. It's really neat. And we we usually do this. I have like a little um, studio in my basement, and we usually have like a full switcher going. But the the um, the audio driver for the the software we're using broke, so we have to wait <laughs> for the update. It's uh, uh all right. I can now add the app there. Okay. Oops. One more second here. Find the other link there. It's 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 very difficult to make a tweet. <laughs> All right. There we go. I think it makes sense. Hopefully. Yep. There we go. All right. And I favorited it too, which is absolutely nothing. It gives me an email and it makes me feel good. So that that's something. <laughs> Fantastic. That is that is always good to boost my, my self-esteem. Mm-hmm. All right. We will start in three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Behind the Video. This is episode 74, and joining me as always is my lovely and talented co-host, Tim Street, who assures me that his internet has been fixed. The cable guy came out and everything, right, Tim? Yeah. I, I just have to stop talking bad about certain uh, ISP um, <laughs> people. Uh, and then my internet works fine. So as long as I don't mention any names of corporate evil places, uh, I should. Oh, I got cut off again. <laughs> you should be fine. So, well, that is good to see you back and uh, looking better than ever in in the always improving Google Hangouts app. And we have a guest today, a very special guest, Tim. And who is that? Well, we, we have somebody who uh, comes to us from the television world who. Uh, does something that you wouldn't expect in television, and that's creating languages for shows like Game of Thrones. David, you, you want to tell us about yourself? David J. Peterson. Hello, and thanks for having me. Yeah, so my name is David Peterson. Yeah, so David, what do, what do you do? I, uh, I create languages, and that's pretty much my job at this point. Um, or at least that's how I make money. Uh, so I, cre- I, I started out working on HBO's Game of Thrones. I created the Dothraki language and then later uh, the High Valyrian language and an offshoot of it, Astapori Valyrian, which is a variant of Low Valyrian. Um, and then let's see, I, I work on Defiance where I've created three languages, Castathan, Arathian, uh, and Indogene. And then um, I started work on another show called Starcrossed on the CW that, that nobody's heard of yet because it hasn't debuted, but um, I created a language there called Sondive. Sounds very French and snooty, which I love. And um, let's see, I, I, I created a language for a pilot for sci-fi that I haven't heard if it's got picked up yet. We'll see. And I created the uh, Dark Elf language for Thor, the Dark World. And how long does it take to create a language? It doesn't That's seem like it's a simple process, right? 
Yeah, well, ideally you should have about a year, but usually with uh, Hollywood you've got about two months, if that. Um, so I, I have a way of, uh, of, of fudging it for a little bit until I can then go back and fix things up later. Uh, and I usually don't make too many mistakes. <laughs> and do the fans call you out on it if you do? Yes, they do. That's that's actually one of the things that uh, I, I think that uh, at least some you know directors producers they don't get. They always say, well, you know, if you if they make a mistake, nobody's going to know except you. And ah, that's not true. Nobody's going to know immediately, but they'll figure it out. They always figure it out, and I'm always the one that has to deal with it. <laughs> it's got to be challenging to do that. So so you start off kind of I guess if you only have a two month time span, it's a maybe it's just an over kind of a, an overview kind of language, right? Where you have enough to meet the script requirements. Um, I, what are some of the challenges, though? Do you think about what what kind of depth you have to add later? How do you uh, how do you start? Is there a simple process you follow? Is there you know because I'm thinking back to like you know Spanish class with verb conjugation mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. Are there basic frameworks that you that you start from? What's the, what's the process? Uh, well, I guess a um, uh, framework not in the sense for creating the language, but at least for filling out the document so I remember what, uh, what things I have to account for. But uh, really all, all languages are the same. What they have to do is be able to translate any possible thought uh, or, uh, or, or means of expression that we might have. And they just do it in different ways. So um, really uh, at the beginning you just have to make sure that it meets the translatability goal, but um, you know, creatively you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and then uh, I think the one of the things that uh, some people are confused about as far as the size of a language is the grammar tends to be pretty fixed, so once it gets to a certain point it's pretty much done. It's just the, uh, the words, the lexicon that you know, takes the rest of your life to fill out. Um, so that's the part that takes a long time. So when it comes to doing something new, I might only have the number of words that I need to translate whatever's in the script. Usually not. Usually I have more, but I, 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 that's all I would need. But the grammar needs to be able to handle any possible, any possible sentence, even if you didn't have a say, even if you didn't have a noun for chair, you have to be able to. Um, translate any any possible sentence that would use a noun in any type of position so forth. Fascinating stuff. And what's the background that you had to get into this? Are you a linguist by by trade? Was, did you study world languages or did is this something that you developed on your own? No, I, I've studied linguistics at, at UC Berkeley. I, I got a, a BA there and then a master's in linguistics at UC San Diego. Um, but uh, at the same time when I started studying linguistics I also started uh, creating languages just for fun and uh, it's been for about uh, it was uh, 13 years ago I think so I've just been creating languages the entire time and then I also study languages for fun um, like I, I started that back at my last year in high school when I discovered that it would be really fun to just uh, learn more languages and I tried to learn as many as I could uh, and I have kept up with that pretty much and actually picked up more lately um, so my, if, uh... If I said that I uh, I watched a video last night, mm -hmm. what, what would that mean? That means that you watched a video. What's well, the trick well, here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I guess what I'm bringing up is is that in languages, you know, like even in in English, uh, the meaning of something uh, could change. If, if I said I watched a video, you might think I watched a video on YouTube or I watched something on Netflix when actually I either watched a VHS or I watched a music video on MTV. Uh, that, that meaning has changed. And so where I'm going with this is do you have that in, in the structure of the languages that you're creating? Do things change over time? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's actually the simplest part of language change, which is just meaning change, because that's the type of thing that changes over a generation. Uh, you know, back in the back in the '90s, if you said I, I watched a video last night, it really did mean a VHS tape, because that was the most salient example. Um, you know, or if you were a teenager, it meant you watched something on MTV back when MTV was relevant. Um, now the most salient example is just a, a video on YouTube or anything else, but basically an internet video. That's kind of the most salient example of the word video. 
Um, and it would be extremely atypical to say that you, you threw in a VHS, even though I still haven't got rid of mine, and I still have a VHS player. I, I, I can't give it up. I, I, I don't think, oh, no, we did, we did replace Casablanca, but I don't have another, no, wait, I think I did replace Edward Scissorhands, but there's a lot of videos I just don't have. I'm sorry, on, on DVD or, you know, just streaming or whatever. But, um, so yeah, there's, there's three basic components to language change. One of them is semantic change, and that's what you're talking about here. Um, and that's something that, you know, the meanings of words can change over a generation in slight ways or, or in larger ways. Um, and then the easiest example is really with slang and usually with adjectives. So how, you know, something like bad can go from meaning bad to meaning good in the 80s to generally meaning bad again. I mean, so I, I, you when, can't really when, say bad anymore. You have to say badass in order to get that old meaning, I think. <laughs> so when, when you're doing this for shows, do you go into that depth, or is it just not, you, you don't have no. the time to deal with slang? Well, I don't have the time, but I do it anyway. Uh, you have to, is the thing. Uh, because if you're, producing a, if you're producing a realistic language, the only way to get, uh, to pr the only way to create a language that looks like the languages that we have in our world is to produce that same level of linguistic depth. And so really what I do is I generally start with a proto-language um, and a, a usual kind of handy uh, hand mark, or hallmark is to start a thousand years before whatever time you need the language. Uh, our languages go back much further than that, but a thousand years is a good enough time to show a fair amount of change um, that, that, is actually, that actually produces something replicable. Um, it's kind of like, um, actually, I don't even think, if you go a thousand years before, let's say, 1900, I don't think that you even have vulgar Latin still. Vulgar Latin would have been moved on. But it's like the from very old Spanish to modern Spanish, if you think. And there was enough of a change there that you could actually see a big difference. Um, so I start with that uh, proto-language, and that's usually created uh, a priori, maybe with some uh, hints of further depth beyond that. Then I take that proto-language and evolve it, evolving the grammar, the meanings of words, and also the sounds. And those are the three basic uh, er ways that languages change uh, over a simulated period of a thousand years to produce um, the modern version of the language. And do you start with something familiar? You know, I, I maybe in the case of the game Game of Thrones, it, they're humans, they're not aliens. So do yeah. you do you look at like bases like Latin and that kind of thing, or do you do you, do you start from scratch as well? Uh, no, you start from scratch. You, uh, you don't really need to do that anymore. Um, if you've been creating languages for a while, you don't need to do that anymore. Lots of people start off that way, where, uh, and, and I started off this way. If you go to my old website, you'll see uh, a bunch of languages where it's like, this one was, was clearly based on Turkish because I was really into Turkish. This one was clearly based on Hawaiian because I was into Hawaiian and so forth. Um, but after you do that for a while, you just start to really understand how languages can vary and the ways that they can vary. And so you can just really just jump in there and do exactly what you want uh, and achieve the effect that you're interested in achieving without having to worry about, um, you know, basing it on another language. It's really now, fascinating. Do you, do you teach any of your languages that you've created? Have you done seminars on them? Uh, no, I do the occasional presentation at like a, a, a fantasy or sci-fi convention, but I don't think I'd have the patience uh, to teach a language, <laughs> any language, even, even, a, even a spoken language. I just get too annoyed at the mistakes that were being made, and then annoyed at myself when I made mistakes. It would just be a frustrating experience. Now, when you get angry, do you start yelling in, in Klingon or a different language? <laughs> Which I, you, you're, I mean, do you really ever find... Do you, I mean, would you consider yourself to be proficient in the languages that you're creating? Could you speak to another person if they were as well? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. I, 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 there are different types of people when it comes to learning and using languages. Uh, and some people are very adept at uh, speaking them right off. Uh, and they don't worry about the mistakes they make. I'm much more of the other type that uh, will sit there for an hour and make sure that I've composed just the right sentence. And then I'll, I'll, I'll spit it off fluently, and then the person will have a fluent response, and I'll be like, oh, fuck. You know, I just <laughs> done. Um, no, I, 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 I've, never been su I've never been super good at just the conversant part. So like with, uh, with, with the languages I created, I know the grammars very, very, very well. 
and I can write them pretty well, but uh, speaking them just uh, off the cuff is just well beyond me. And that actually goes for most of the languages I've studied. Um, I get I get too hung up on myself. Whereas uh, I've met people where it's like, like you know, in Spanish, I know that my level of comprehension um, and is my fluency is much better than theirs. But they'll just rattle off in Spanish. They'll make dozens of mistakes, but it won't matter because they're still getting the basic points across and they're still essentially being functionally more fluent than I am as I'm trying to make sure that I get every single subjunctive just right. You know, It's got to be tough so, sometimes. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious. Mind. How do you go from creating languages to getting a job in television creating languages for a TV show? Well, ordinarily you didn't, uh, and in fact before me you didn't. I think probably the only qualification you could have had to create a language for a show was not to have created a language before, <laughs> because that was the case with everybody who'd done it before me. Um, in, in my case, we just kind of lucked out. Uh, it was just happenstance that there was a book that was really popular at the time when the showrunners for Game of Thrones were uh, were creating... Um, I'm sorry, they were, they were doing the pilot. They had the pilot greenlit. And so what happened, there was a book that was really popular at the time, or, or you know, it made the New York Times bestsellers list called In the Land of Invented Languages by Erika Okrent, uh, which was about uh, created languages and also language creators. And um, so they, they contacted her, uh, actually, and then she sent them to the Language Creation Society, which had helped her with some research for her book. And the Language Creation Society put together an application process and announced it to everybody that created languages. So I applied, <laughs> and then um, I just happened to get the job. And the rest now, is history. Are, are, are you a fantasy and sci-fi um, person yourself? Do you, you uh, enjoy that, or are you just strictly a language guy? Uh, to an extent. I, 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 like, I like movies and TV shows. Uh, I'm not really a, a reader of, of fantasy and sci-fi. Uh, but then I guess uh, I've always had a, a, a tortured uh, relationship with reading my entire life, so it's no surprise. But um, I, I, I grew up watching um, Star Trek The Next Generation. I remember that uh, I had heard, uh, I guess, of Star Trek when I was, when I was very young, but um, uh, a, neighbor, a neighbor on my street uh, came in and showed me the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation when it aired. Uh, I was in first grade, so I didn't really follow it, but I knew that it was something interesting. So I, you know, kept watching it along with billions of other TV shows. That's what I did as a kid. I just watched TV shows. My mother said as long as I got my homework done, I could do whatever I wanted. So <laughs> I watched TV every single day. Didn't matter what. TGIF, Popeye, I Love Lucy, MASH. Uh, what was Barney Miller? Whatever. I, I've seen everything. I've seen every episode of everything. But yeah, so I, I loved Star Trek growing up. I had no idea that there was a language in it. Um, I knew of Lord of the Rings. I had no idea there was a language in it. I didn't even know people created languages um, until college. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of especially um, but movies and TV shows. I loved Star Wars uh, growing up. Pretty much, no. uh, if there was really kind of cool special effects, I was there. Now, when somebody comes to, to you and they're like, hey, we'd like you to create a language, how do you go out about pricing your services? Do you uh, have a way to walk them through it? Because, I, I mean, I'm a producer, and if I come to you and go, hey, I've got this, this show that takes place on Earth, but it also takes place in outer space, and I, I need the outer space people to speak another language, but they also mm -hmm. speak English, and sometimes it's like Spanglish. They mix them together. Yeah. Where, where do you start on a conversation in setting up pricing structure for that? Uh, really, it's just based on my previous work. Um, so, you know, the, the other shows that I'm doing and also how much time I have because I've gotten busy lately. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it usually seems to work out all right. Um, and usually, I mean, do you, do you have an agent or do you put together a bid for them? I mean, just kind of general terms, how do you work? No, I usually just negotiate one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, I'm sure I could probably benefit from having an agent, but uh, I don't know if they'd know what to do with me. Um, it's not like there's always going to be steady and regular work for somebody who's creating languages, and it's not something that I think agents will have a lot of experience with. But, you know, but, maybe but one day. Are, 
there are people that, that are doing this, like with the new Superman movie, somebody created the uh, Krypton language, right? Kind of. Um, they, <laughs> they, they, well, they, 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 they just they contacted somebody nearby. That's, that's, uh, that's what they'd done for every single project before. They just went to a nearby university and said, does somebody want to help out with this? Gotcha. Um, so uh, one would hope that it would, it, would, it would happen differently now, but you know, uh, some things you can't change. You there, Lon? What? Lon, did we lose you? I think we may have. His, his picture isn't moving. Yeah, we may have lost Lon here. Um, so let me see if uh, we've got Lon on the chat. Hold on a second. This will be an edit point. Sure. We've been uh, we've definitely been having some some gremlins here. <laughs> Oh, there he is. His connection dropped. Man. My connection he, dropped. Yeah. Yeah, I now have two pictures of you up. Yeah, I think the other one should uh, disappear in a second. So, we, okay. We, we, cool. we, it's uh, you know, some days it's just glitchier yeah. than others. Hopefully, the broadcast will continue. So, um, David, I, I looked on your resume too. You're also um, an alien culture consultant. So, oh, I, I yeah. would imagine languages and, and culture go hand in hand. Um, what's uh? You know, what's involved with that, and, and, and how do you think about alien cultures, given we haven't experienced any yet? Um, do, do, you, do you try to think outside the box when coming up with uh, how a culture might interact with, with humanity? Well, with, um, with Defiance, which is where, where I started with this, it's, it's kind of a, a question. Or, well, I guess a Defiance was a pretty unique, um, w a unique opportunity, because what happened is... Um, the the guy who was the driving force for for Defiance, Rockne O'Bannon, who wrote the first pilot, um, left the show uh, kind of abruptly before it really got started, and so then a new showrunner was brought on, um, uh, Kevin Murphy, and um, you know it was this thing where this is a a property that I guess you know the 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 head guy it wasn't his idea, it wasn't his baby, and so what he decided to do was kind of open things up and say you know. We have this massive world, this massive idea. Uh, anybody who has ideas, you know, we're all going to be kind of owners of this property. Let's all contribute and make it something good. Um, and so, in that case, um, you know, I was I was the alien language and culture consultant, but I wasn't the only one creating stuff. So it was kind of like uh, everybody had some ideas, basic ideas for what. The different aliens were going to be like, you know, the Cassidans and the Arathians. And then we all just kind of started contributing different bits. Would it be cool if they did this? Would it be cool if they did this? So, um, in, in that case, there's there's a couple things. First, I want to make sure, like, kind of a, almost my job on, on that show is to make sure things aren't too human, too stereotypical, or too much like another show. <laughs> and so, um, you know, when, when it comes to, to these guys, I really look at them more as um, almost like humans that have no connection to Earth. Because if you look at them... Uh-oh. Did I disappear? I think I disappeared. Or did Tim disappear? Okay, Lon disappeared. Sorry, all right. Uh, Tim, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. You're, okay. you're still on. Okay. Um, so... Uh, it, if you look at the aliens that are, are that are in defiance, for example, they're basically humanoid, and some of the things that make us really uh, uniquely human are the same about them, which is that we still have to the the aliens just like us, they still have to work together to accomplish things and survive. You can't just have one go off on its own and survive and thrive. Um, they still kind of uh, produce offspring in the same way. Offspring are still weak and need to be nurtured. Um, very mammalian in a way.
Okay. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. Yep. Now it says it's live again, doesn't it? Yeah. All right. So I, I went into an incognito window, and hopefully that will uh, that will keep it going. So we'll see what we'll see what this looks like. I, we, we've been getting a recording, so I don't think we're going to lose anything. But cool. Um, we will uh, continue forward. So why don't you finish that thought, and then we'll uh, we'll keep going. Uh, okay, I did. Okay. But I don't know if you heard all of it. <laughs> I think I think we got all of it. So we'll see how it. Uh, we'll, we'll edit it together when we uh, get to the end of that. So. Okay. Um, so Tim, do you want to move on to the news? Yeah, let's let's move on to the news. What what is going on this week? Well, there is a lot going on this week, and we we will start with our YouTube top five of the week. And and uh, and David, feel free to uh, uh, chime in on anything that that is of interest, but uh, no pressure. Uh, we won't quiz you on any of any of the YouTube news. But um, right. what I wanted to do this week, Tim, yeah, you know, we've been always trying to find different ways to look at the charts. So I, I went to the Two mogul uh, most viewed charts of the week and most viewed channels, that is. And uh, number five was the X Men movies. And what I did this time is I pulled out all the Vivo stuff because you know the, the music videos get played a lot, and I figured we should look at creators. So um, X Men movies, uh, one video, 19.4 million views for the week. It's actually higher now than it was earlier in the week, and that's of course due uh, to the uh, the trailer that they just released for one of the new X Men movies there. So. Um, that was a, a big one. Uh, Sky does Minecraft number four. Our game player guy he continues to uh, do well there. David, do you, do you do video game work too? Uh, well, I've worked a little bit on the Defiance video game. Um, you know, because there, there, it's it's the concomitant show and video game. Uh, but other than that, I guess I just play them. Because there's a lot of you know a lot of story now working their way into these things, and I would imagine a lot of languages too, right? You'd think the, the, the possibility is there, uh, but it's been harder to break into the game industry. They're, 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 they're usually happier with just having somebody that already works for them just make up something on the spot. Hmm. Right. Let's, ha that. let's have the interns work on it. Yeah, right. Yeah, pretty much. Hey, kid, create a language for us. And, uh, <laughs> and you're, you're, often, you're often running with it. Because I, I know that... You know, the there was a there's a Star Wars game that's been out for a long time. It's about ten years old. It's a role playing game, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, and yeah. uh, the characters all you know have verbal talking, and there's a lot of different races and species, and probably beyond what you know they developed for the movies. And there's a lot of blah blah blah. blah. I hear a lot of repetition, uh, yeah. so I imagine they're just saying the same gibberish every time, and you're you're reading the the thing below it. But yeah, uh, all, all gibberish. And... Yeah. <laughs> This the, the, sounds the same, right? Yeah, Skyrim was just uh, intern work. <laughs> right. So. It's got to drive you nuts to hear to hear that when you're yeah. playing so, the game. There are so many language creators, too, that would just you know kill for the opportunity to do something like that. They'd probably even do it for free, though I shouldn't say that. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to keep the, keep the crap from getting into the game, right? So. Yeah, well, you know. Well, number three on our list, who does speak some some sort of language, uh, is Smosh at 19.8 million views this week. And uh, number two is actually a non-English channel. That is LA Corn HD3. It's actually Thai television. Tim, 22 million views. Full screen is their channel. Is their uh, multi-channel partner? Good, gotta love that. Good Which move is, uh, by full screen, right? Yeah, expanding. And, and what were they showing? What, uh, you know, what? I, I, you may have to watch it so you can tell us what they're saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a number of web series on there. There's a, they're all in, in Thai, um, but I, wow. I think, yeah. And you know, it's one of these things. We saw this last week with um, last week. It was a, a Turkish music channel that was number oh, one yeah. on the list. Oh yeah. So you know, there's a lot of um, you know, it's just such an international thing. I look on my own channel where yeah, I, I went and looked at where my revenue was coming from because you can see where you know where your views and revenue come from. And mm -hmm. you know, the United States is a majority of where my dollars are coming from, mainly because I'm reviewing U.S. products for my YouTube channel, but. Um, getting a lot of overseas too. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty remarkable. It's a it's a real international marketplace. That's Maybe awesome. you should start reviewing Disney toys. <laughs> I think that niche has been covered by the Disney collector. So so David, you'll get a kick out of this. There's a a woman who uh, reviews uh, all the toys that are Disney branded. Um, you wow. know, all, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And what she does, uh, she's called the Disney collector. She opens up the boxes, takes everything out, and talks about it. Uh, okay. She had 36.6 .6 million views in just the last week alone. Okay, and is she? Does she have all of the gummy bears? She she probably does, and if not, she can afford to buy them. Because Tim, what do you think she's making on this? Right? I mean, we're we're talking like 
My guess is is that if she's you know fully monetizing this, she's probably doing between two hundred fifty thousand and half a million a month. That is remarkable, and she's no uh, no affiliation. She's just herself. Wow, uh, I would love to see that, especially if she's overly critical. Wow, he has another piece of crap. Minute. <laughs> you know what's funny is she she passes no judgment on any of this stuff. I have watched a couple of them. My my excuse wow. is that I have a six month old, so I'm doing research. Um, but uh, yeah, she uh, she just takes everything out of the box and just shows how it works. And I think um, you know, I, I think her audience are kids. You know, little kids that are you know looking about you know how to how to spend their allowance. Um, but also oh. the parents, right? Um, and you know it's intriguing. And Tim, I'm going to try to get this guy on um, because I was talking to this guy who um, a friend of mine works with him. Uh, he he blows stuff up. Oh, and that's good. That's good. That's good for kids. Kids should do more of that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Debt cord. You know, he he shoots things with uh, high caliber machine guns. Like he does all this crazy stuff. He, he, oh. He's probably very close friends with ATF. <laughs> he is. He's got a license, apparently, or so I'm told. But um, what what's fascinating, though, in talking with uh, my friend who has been talking with him is that uh, I'm getting a higher CPM than he is, and I think it's because Ooh. of the audience, right? Like, there's an audience thing here that there are a lot of kids and a lot. And if you, if you think about it, Google is selling advertising on the audience. Content right. is not the scarcity point. It's it's the audience is the scarcity point. And I, and right. I I'm, my gut is that. Channels that appeal to young teenage boys are not going to monetize as well as channels that appeal to adults. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think there's a lot more scarcity in the marketplace. We're going to try to get him on, and we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him. And I'm going to try to talk Great. to him offline about it, too, because I think it would be interesting to see that. Maybe, maybe you should leave a comment on his YouTube channel. Yes, we should because if if it'll let, let you do it. So, uh, this week was the uh, the big. Well, actually, last week was the big rollout week, but it had just started when we did last week's show. Um, 88,000 users have spoken out against the new YouTube comments because they now incorporate Google Plus. Um, no. I'm, I'm going to gripe yeah. about the fact that Google Plus can't keep this show up for <laughs> for a little bit longer, but we're also not paying them for this, so I should be I, I shouldn't complain too much. You but, get yeah. what you pay for, Lon. You do. Yeah, actually, I checked the latest number. It's up to 112,000. That's as of Reddit today. Wow. So people are not happy. You know, YouTube is kind of like the uh, like a small town. When you when you change anything, people are not happy, you know. Um, but I, I think there's some val validity to this, mainly because you know, unlike a lot of channels, and I and I'm always jinxing myself by saying this, but I, I get a lot of useful comments in my channel, and uh, you know, people asking questions, people helping each other out. It's really been kind of a nice thing to see, you know, some humanity going on on YouTube comments. And what's happened is, is that depending on how your Google Plus settings are set up, you could leave a comment on my channel, and I can't reply to it. On my own channel, hmm. so the the comment is publicly visible on the YouTube channel and presumably on Google Plus, but because their whatever their settings are don't allow me to comment directly, it it doesn't work. And but but if weird. you were a spam company, you could totally leave a comment there about Viagra. <laughs> of course, because that would that would totally work. And unfortunately, our our friend Clintus McGinnis got caught up in a debate on this issue, and and people were posting ASCII drawings of. Uh, of, of of things that uh, aren't safe for this show, um, but uh, <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's a you know it's going to be an issue to try to get these things integrated. I I thought it was kind of a a good thing in in the sense that you could at least have identities tied to this. Um, another problem that Google Comments have had for a long time is you couldn't link to other sites, and, and apparently this uh, right. the Google Plus version lets you do that. Uh, you can call wow. out other folks in the comment stream, so it does bring all the Google Plus functionality over to YouTube Comments, but. Um, it, it hasn't really been a flawless uh, implementation, which is not surprising because things never, um, you know, if you even look at the healthcare thing, nothing ever gets implemented smoothly. So hopefully they'll yep. uh, work out this stuff. But I'm not as upset about it as other people are. Tim, what are you hearing about this? Are people like ready to go to Pitchforks to YouTube HQ here? Yeah, some people are. I mean, they're they're really begging YouTube to fix this and fix it quick. Some people have turned off their comments. They've just disabled comments. Um, because the spammers have been able to get in and really ruin channels. So uh, it, who, who knows? You know, I mean, may, maybe it's it's going to be an opportunity for somebody to uh, launch a new channel off of somebody else's back by spamming their comments, <laughs> right. and uh, and then maybe they'll get a TV show deal out of it. That could because <laughs> there there has been yet another crossover in. Uh, uh, from YouTube to uh, the big time, NBC has nailed, n nabbed, not nailed, nabbed uh, sh uh, YouTube star Shane Dawson. 
who uh, is uh, going to do a half-hour comedy show um, on uh, NBC. And I guess it's, you know, it, it's, it's about time, I think. More, I, we'll see more of this happening, mainly I, because some of these YouTubers have more traffic than the networks do, right? Like, I, I'm, I think it's great that Shane Dawson is getting a deal. But a deal from NBC, it just feels like not a brand fit at all. I mean, if you watch Shane Dawson, he's very irreverent. He's sexual. He, uh, you know, can be uh, uh, very, uh, very liberal in his interpretations of things. There's lots of cross-dressing. Um, to me, if he, if he was on a, you know, like Comedy Central or something like that, I, I could see... Uh, see it flying, but with NBC, it just seems too general of a network for somebody as creatively talented as, as Shane Dawson. So, I, I imagine there's there's going to be some fights in the uh, development rooms about what he can and can't do. Yeah, the network censors. I can just see this. Mm. Maybe, maybe they'll make a bit out of it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe they'll make a book out of it. They could because uh, that's the other thing here, another top uh, uh, YouTube thing. Because um, that's Tim. Tim did this to me, and I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. What does the fox say? Um, I had to go look that up. Uh, this was a few weeks ago. I'm now more with the times. But well, what does the fox say? Uh, I, you know, I can't remember. What is what does the fox say? <laughs> ah, there you go. You so it got to do it. Gotta do it. <laughs> so the fox says that, and it's going to print. So I guess. Now, see, one of the things as a new parent that you begin to loathe is when people, um, you love the fact that people want to get things for the baby, but when they get you things that make noise like that, that could be a, a, real, a real problem. So, um, Tim, is this going to be one of those books that makes noise, or is this just going to be an illustrated uh Well, here, here's book? the thing, is like, it, it's supposed to be an uh, illustrated children's book, which is great and everything, but the song just seems so targeted at young adults and teenagers and 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 uh, people that are into cosplay, uh, you know. Now there is a little kid that sits on Grandpa's lap in the middle of the video, reading him a book. Um, so okay, but I just I don't I don't see it as a natural fit. So you know, devil's in the details. It could be something that kids jo enjoy on one level, and young adults enjoy it on a whole nother level. Kind of like uh, that 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 go to the F to sleep book, right? Yeah, there you go. I gotta say, I am googling what does a fox say for the first time, and the Google image search is a wonder of yeah. just sheer amazement. There is, <laughs> yeah. there is everything here. I defy anybody who doesn't know what this is to look at a Google image search and then to try to figure out what this is. You will not be able to. I think it's, my favorite so far is uh, there's there's Marty McFly with. Um, with uh, his 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 mother from the past, and she says, "What did the fox say?" And it's him replying, "Whoa, heavy." <laughs> there you go. Well, I'll tell you what, David. Here's an opportunity for you because the fox <laughs> language is not developed at all. Oh, so yeah. I think yeah, there's uh, you know the book, because Thank this goodness. is going to be a book. It's going to be a book, and then it's going to be the cartoon show on Saturday morning, and then you yes. got the royalties from the toy sales, and the Disney collector hasn't even gotten into this yet. So yes. Please, uh, here's my card. Come and contact me. <laughs> yeah. Call Please. him now and get this done. So, hey, let's talk about some movies real quick. We'll look at the top five from the box office. It, again, I'm amazed by like the 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 the, the huge, uh, I don't know, canyon between number one and number five. We'll start with number five. Bad Grandpa. Uh, don't is, don't take the kids to see it, but uh, if you like raunchy movies, go see it. And this is like one of these reality movies, right? I mean, the budget for these things must be a lot less because it involves kind of candid camera kind of moments, right? Yeah, they did a really good job for the most part. It's it's grandpa and a kid that plays his grandkid, and they go prank people. And, you know, one, one of my big problems with Borat was that there would be scenes where you just have two actors together, and they're doing funny things, but it kind of spoiled the ground rule of Borat when it was on HBO, and, and that was that you were always playing, he was always playing a joke on somebody. Um, whereas this movie, pretty much, I mean, there are times where they're in the car alone, but for the most part, it, it's it's good pranks that that move the story forward, and it really makes it fun. But but don't don't take your kids; it's is pretty bad. Um, an example of how bad it is: Grandpa decides to make love to a Coke machine outside a gas station. And he gets his privates caught in the machine. <laughs> oh, 
God. So that, that and and oh, you man. see his privates call oh. the machine. Yeah. It's hilarious, but you don't want to take the kids to see Yeah, that's that. that's one we're not gonna go uh, bring the kids yeah. out to. So now you might bring the kids though to Free Birds, which is a Thanksgiving animation film. That one uh, came in at number four, seven and a half million dollars. Uh, you can drop the kids off in there, and then go see Grant Grandpa in the other the other theater. Um, forty one point four million dollars overall, so that one's doing okay. Last Vegas, seven point nine million this weekend, forty six million wow. overall. Um, still uh, hanging on. Uh, Best Man Holiday, which is a sequel to The Best Man, it was a movie that came out about 15 years ago. Uh, that came in uh, almost beat out Thor, which You're surprised kidding. a lot of folks. Kid you not. In fact, it was only a 17 million dollar budget to make it. They've already doubled their money, uh, and it's only the first week. And uh, wow. and wow. I was reading uh, somewhere where they were talking about how it, you know these rankings just don't matter anymore because these you know like like internet video, everything is getting uh, into niches. And and Best Man Holiday is a a film that um, has has a pretty much all African American cast that, as as the first one did, and um, you know it's it's going to have uh, it's going to have some reach, and it's done really well this weekend. Uh, Thor, of course, though, is number one at thirty four point nine million, and I, I believe um, you know it's got a pretty all star cast, another Marvel movie, right? Uh, comic uh, theme thing. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, it's got a pretty cool language too. I hear. Oh really? So what's what what is it? What's the language of Thor? <laughs> you know, I you know I created that right. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. So now let's talk about that because Thor is based on you know some some pretty uh, standard themes in mythology. How, how yeah. did you approach the language for this? Well, so uh, you know Thor and his ilk, they're all uh, you know in Asgard. That's all Scandinavian, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Scandinavian mythos. Uh, their idea was for the the dark elves, and this this came from the uh, from the director of the dark elves. Uh, he wanted them to kind of be Finnic, uh, like that, be f inspired by Finnish in Finland, um, and you know the Finno-Ugric languages. So uh, the language that I created for them, which ended up be calling, it, it was called uh, Shivaisith. It's um, it's got the the Finnish vowel harmony system, and then kind of a grammar that uh, that I devised of of my you know on my own, um, so that I could translate things pretty easily. Even though it turned out to be quite difficult. <laughs> I always make things more difficult for myself than I ought, but um, you know, it it did what it was supposed to do, and uh, I, I actually finally saw Thor on Friday. I was in Spain when it debuted, so I didn't see it, but I saw it on on Friday with friends, and it, you know, it did everything I wanted to do, which was mainly have Thor and Loki, you know, banter <laughs> in the language. Go. Yeah. That's um, cool. And how did they do? Did, 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 have you worked with the actors to try to get them up on the language and how to pronounce different words? Uh, for um, no, for for Thor, I didn't. Um, and how they did was they did all right. They did, <laughs> they did pretty good. They did pretty good. It, it, it sounded pretty good. But but well, that's all what right. are, what are like the feel good moments for you when you're watching your work? Um. Did I miss the last part of that? Say it again. When what what are the feel good moments for you when you're watching your work be performed? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I I'm always delighted when when the actors actually you know produce the first of all the entire sentence and say every single word in it. That's that's a that's a victory. But um, you know, uh, but then once once they've hit that minimum, and you know, most of the time they do. It's uh, it's just how well it's performed and how well they can. Make make you feel it because um, and I and it's it's I guess it's hard to quantify in words, but you can tell it on the screen when they really feel what they're doing and they're really feeling the language um, and that and that varies quite a bit and just I some of the more outstanding moments really have blown me away. Uh, one of them was was obviously that scene where Daenerys reveals that she speaks. Uh, High Valyrian in season three that was just incredible. I thought that might have been a high water mark of the series, and it just bowled me over. Um, but then there'll always just be you know little bits. You know maybe if it's just like a, especially um, when there's kind of a longer phrase, and I usually get worried about that something's going to get dropped, and they just do it exactly right. It's just ah, it, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, like uh, Tony Curran is one of my favorites. He was in Thor. Um, he played Thor's grandfather in the in the scenes in the beginning of the movie, and he plays a, a guy named Daytok on on Defiance, and um, 
he's always outstanding. I, lo I love watching him. <laughs> he's such a jerk on the show. <laughs> he's the nicest guy you'll ever meet, but man, his character is just, oh. <laughs> acting. <That's great. laughs> yeah, acting. Love it. Hey, hey, Lana, I've got a Nickelodeon joke for you. We What's used that? to tell this when I was at Nickelodeon. Uh, if you're Russian when you head into the bathroom and you're Finnish when you come out of the bathroom, what are you while you're in the bathroom? I have no idea. European. <laughs> there you go. Good Nickelodeon joke. <laughs> it's good clean humor. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good clean bathroom humor around the uh, thing there. there you, go. you know, what, one thing uh, there was a sci-fi show, uh, Stargate, which I'm sure you've probably seen, David. Yep. And uh, and it, they take this whole Thor and Asgard thing to a whole different direction as well with yeah, with yeah. aliens with their own languages. And uh, uh, it's a shame that the uh, the show's still not uh, going. They had a they had a great uh, sequel that just kind of fell out of uh, viewership ratings there, but. Uh, um, kind of a neat, uh, neat approach that they took to that, to that story. So, so yeah. you might be able to um, buy some stuff from uh, Comcast soon, Tim. TV shows and movies through their cable box. I guess you can rent them now and had have been able to for. She's here for like the last the, ten years. The, I can do the on demand. Seems like the only people blocking this deal are the theater owners, and they are not happy about this uh, going going quick. I mean, the the theater, the cable industry is worried. The theater owners are worried. Everybody's worried. About them selling movies through the cable box. Yeah, uh, I mean they don't want stuff to go there they, right away, and uh, the the big push by the studios is to do day and date so that they can get oh. stuff out the door everywhere at the same time and take right. advantage of all the marketing behind it. And um, there's there's a big war going on right now between the studios, the theaters, and the cable companies as to what those windows are going to be because. Theater wants to stay on top. They want to be that first window. And uh, if the money's not there and DVD sales aren't picking it up, where, where are you going to go if you're a studio? What, what are you going to do? So, uh, you know, money will win out. Man, let me just say from a consumer's perspective, especially as I get older and crabbier, I would love for there just to be a release date on your television so that when the, sh when the movie debuts, I just go home and turn on the movie. And if I want to pause it and go to the bathroom, I can do that and then turn it back on when I when I get back. I would love that to be our future. Me Even too. if that's going to destroy the entire now, entertainment for, industry. For, which would for, those, for those of you who are listening to the audio version of the show, just to let you know, David looks like he's in his 20s. My guess would be you're in your 30s, <laughs> but he, he definitely looks like he's in his early 20s. So uh, to hear him say that is, is uh, pretty funny. <laughs> well, I think we're at a stage in life now where, where health-wise, you know, 60 is the new 30, but, yeah, but yeah. mentally, 30 is the new 60. So I think uh, <laughs> there's, days, there's days where I, I get pretty crabby too, and then, uh, but, uh, and then, then I go on, uh, uh, on, on Tumblr or something and complain about it. But <laughs> speaking of which, um, so uh, we have a Canadian producer for our show, Jason Perrier, who is still oh, fighting with, uh, with, the, with the powers that be up there to get an internet connection that he can actually come on the show with. He, he's supposed to be our news, our news guy, but um, he, he can't seem to get his internet to last for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Uh -huh. But um, he's in Canada, so he had to put this thing, thing in here, Tim, from The Hollywood Reporter. Apparently, the uh, mayor of Toronto is getting his own television show while he continues to make... Uh, I guess, you know, if you're going to be a train wreck, you may as well cash in on it, right? Yeah, well, he definitely got uh, some coverage on Saturday Night Live last night, so if you get a chance, check that out. Um, but um, And, oh my gosh, John Stewart is having a field day with yeah. this guy. He keeps begging him to resign. Uh, he's like, he's, John Stewart's like, look, it's bad for me, Mr. Mayor, but you need to resign. <laughs> he goes, I love you. You know, you're great for my show. You give me so much stuff to talk about. But I mean, it's just hilarious. This guy is like, you know, talking about his crack problem. And he's like, yeah, I, I was really bombed. You know, and it's like he uses his drinking problem as an excuse for his crack addiction. <laughs> God, it's, it, it's just <laughs> remarkable. Let me let me say this. So Defiance Films in Toronto. So I've been up there a few times. And let me tell you, they are so snooty about their city. So I am just loving this scandal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted. And, Maybe, and I, I'm sure you have to you you need to remind them of this mayor, I'm sure, right? Oh, oh yeah. No, no, no. May he stay in office forever. And um and even and even when he's a when he's an afterthought, 
I will remember him always when I back up in Toronto. I, I can the, the Rob him. Ford Foundation. It'll be like a party university or something. <laughs> Well, let's see if this TV show will get him out of his job. But, but something tells me he's going to milk this thing for all it's worth. I guess you know if you're if you're going in a certain direction that you know go all the way. What was it, uh, Blagovich up there in Chicago, who or or in uh, oh, Illinois? Look, yeah, he's yeah, Blagojevich. Yeah, he milked it for all it was worth. He went. What he he did the uh, the the commercials for the for the pistachio nuts there. He was on. Uh, yeah. was he on uh, uh, Donald Trump's show there too? He was. Uh, he was he was getting was every every inch he could get out of that thing before uh, before his world crumbled. So we'll have to uh, see what happens. And he, oh. he, he should start a Tumblr called Blog Oyevich. <laughs> Where is he now? Nobody talks about him now because they're all talking about them. He's in jail, right? Yeah, he's in jail, and, and the mayor of Toronto has has far surpassed his uh, his sleaziness. So um, oh, so we'll see where he it. goes. So move I on to our it. tip of the week, real quick, Tim. So I, I uh, as you know, down in my my basement studio, which we we cannot use at the moment because the stupid driver for the software that I use doesn't work with Mavericks, which is a a hint for all you kids watching: don't upgrade until you know everything's going to work. I uh, haven't. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you've got stuff that like depends on things, I would be careful with it. But um, you know, oh, here's speaking of that, mm -hmm. I upgraded to Mavericks, but I've not upgraded um, some of the apps. Like they want me to upgrade Keynote, mm -hmm. they want me to upgrade, and um, I'm hearing that a lot of people are dissatisfied with the upgraded Keynote. So I haven't upgraded the apps, but I have upgraded the OS. I did. Oh. Uh, I, I also because I'm stupid, I upgraded the apps too. Um, it'll keep your old ones, so it doesn't overwrite the old ones. Uh, and what's nice about the new one, there are some things missing from it, um, but it will now, like, if you if you have, like, uh, your keynote presentation in iCloud, it works on everything. Oh, so that's cool. Yeah, it really, it, it, they've done a nice job there. I mean, some of the more detailed things that they, they missed, you know, but but overall, it, it uh, I found it works pretty good. Um, and down in my studio, Tim, as you know, I have the Blackmagic switcher. Um, I think I'm going to be talking about a little bit of this at New Media Expo, so I'm looking forward to sharing what I've uh, learned through a lot of expensive mistakes. Um, but I have uh, you know, one of the problems with the Blackmagic switcher is you have to use a computer to do the switching. So you don't have like a unless you want to spend like another four thousand dollars, you don't have a button you can push. And I've been playing around with a whole bunch of different stuff, and I decided to try a Windows tablet, and I got this Lenovo thing refurbed for like uh, actually for nothing because I had affiliate credit. Let's see, um, we can't see. Hold it by uh, the mic. Here it is. There we go. So. Uh, it is a full-blown Windows 8 computer that you can hold. And it's on a tablet. It's on a tablet. Um, so it's, this like, one, it's basically like Surface, but it's not a, um, a Microsoft brand. Right. It's a Lenovo, uh, the Lenovo brand. And you know what they've been doing is they've been taking those cheap netbooks and cramming them into, into, into tablets. Um, but it works great because I can, I can actually push the buttons and have it, have it do stuff on the switcher mm -hmm. like you would if you had a real control surface. So... Um, I found it to be really helpful, and if you have other Windows software you need to run, it'll it'll work. Uh, you know, it'll work just like anything else would. They have uh, smaller versions, uh, Lenovo and other manufacturers too. So I think Dell has got one. There's uh, uh, stuff coming out from a whole bunch of different. You know, all the PC manufacturers are coming out with different shapes and sizes. But you can get now like an iPad or or smaller size tablet. Asus has a really nice little one uh, that is a full Windows machine in that very small footprint, which is. Wow. Uh, I think pretty cool. It's nice to have some. If I was a Windows guy, I'd be all over it. But yeah, it could be. It's like, you know, it's it's like you talking to me about Pampers right now. I'm just I'm not in the market <laughs> You're not for doing it. it. So, <laughs> and I'm a Mac guy too. Don't get me wrong. I love my Mac, but there's certain things that um, I, I was trying to do, and and sometimes you got to pick the right tool for the job. And uh, uh, this thing is uh, it's been pretty pretty good. So I'm I'm look I'm looking forward to. Uh, playing around with it a little bit more. Although I did find, of course, that because it's Windows, it's a lot more susceptible to stuff. So I was downloading VLC this morning, and I hadn't had my cup of coffee yet. I almost clicked on the link that uh, links you to the unofficial version that installs, you know, Lord knows what on your computer as well. So, yeah. so you got to, you know, got to keep your guard up on this stuff. It's not like using a tablet that can't get virus. These things all can do that. So, well, David, I want to thank you for uh, joining us today, and sorry for all the technical problems we had, but I think... Uh, uh, enough of the show recorded. <laughs> All of it did. Don't worry, we're fine. Uh, to be able to get something useful out of there. We really found uh, what you did interesting. Where can people find more about you? Uh, well, you can follow me on, on Twitter at my horrible Twitter handle that you can't pronounce. It's Daedalus, but it's spelled like it was written in old Latin, so D-E-D-A-L-V-S. And then um, you can plug that into Tumblr and you'll find me. So I'm, I think I'm mainly hanging around on Twitter and Tumblr. And then you can also follow my language pursuits on the Dothraki blog, 
which is dothraki.com. And you also, uh, you're, you're part of a, an association that makes yes, a language makers, much. right? Yes, I, and I'm also now the president of the Language Creation Society, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to you know, promoting the art and science of language creation. And you can find us at conlang.org. Conlang is C-O-N-L-A-N-G. Thank when, you for reminding me. Oh, no problem. And when you have a meeting, what, what do you have to vote on what language to talk in when you meet? Oh goodness, it's 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 English or I'm out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I my the uh, president of my college when I was going to uh, going to college back in the early days of uh, the 90s. Um, he uh, he was an Esperanto enthusiast. Ah, so it's still uh, there's still a group out there trying to push that, right? Yeah, we had to, we had to talk in Fortran and Pasquale, so it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tim, Tim had binary languages to deal with there. And Tim, where if people were to dial you up on a binary transmission medium, where would they find all of your stuff? At one Tim Street on Twitter or dot com. And you can find me at Lon Seidman, L O N S E I D M A N. The good news is, Tim, I think I figured out why my thing kept dropping out, so I'm going to um, not repeat the same mistake I did last week or this week. Overheard. Um, Overheard. <laughs> so we got that fixed, and uh, and that is because we have a behind the video presence on Google Plus, and I logged into it the wrong way. Uh, uh -huh. so every time I clicked out of the window, it was it was causing trouble. But uh, we are at behindthevideo.com that links you to our Google Plus community, so you can interact with us. We also have a page. Uh, plus.google.com behind the video plus will get you to us plus sign not plus and we are on Stitcher and iTunes and YouTube so hit the subscribe button on any one or all of those services and we record this show uh, every Sunday morning at 11:30 a.m. Eastern uh, 8:30 a.m. Pacific time and Tim is always bright-eyed and bushy-tailed with his cup of joe for those uh, early morning Sundays and we thank you for watching and uh, we will be back again next week this show is a wrap Thanks, guys. thanks, David. Thanks, Lon. Thank thanks. you, Tim. Thanks, thanks David. A, yeah, thanks a lot, and thanks for bumping this a half an hour, even though I ended up not needing it.